You know, it's a really well-kept secret, but I'm going to let you in. The rapid charging network in the US has suffered some reliability issues over the years. The CCS1 plug adopted in the US has some design issues which made it a bit more cumbersome and a bit less reliable than its European counterpart. And charging stations in the US were often built with an eye on the prize for money for installation and little regard for longevity. A combination that's led to some recurrent reliability issues for some networks. How bad? A new Electrify America charging site went live west of Portland, Oregon just before the holidays. Nikki was there last week and two out of the six stations were already offline after just two weeks. And last year we saw pretty much every automaker jump ship from CCS to Tesla's charging plug, or as Tesla rechristened it, the North American charging standard. And that's left a lot of people justifiably concerned. So let's get into where we are with that transition and what that means for everyone driving EVs. Since I'm one of the few people living in the US who've used a Tesla supercharger to charge a non-Tesla vehicle, I have got the task of bringing you the latest update on where we're going with the transition to the Tesla charging connector. Cut! The transition to the North American charging standard, or NACS. Cut! Oh, all right. The transition to J. 3400. I suppose I should just be glad that they didn't change its name to... What the hell is... Because yes, just in time for Christmas and as promised, SAE International, formerly the Society of Automotive Engineers, an organisation that defines a lot of automotive standards, gave us the gift of a new standard that will define the rollout of charging infrastructure across North America from here on out. So let's do... A very quick recap for those who've not been playing along at home. In the US there have been lots of charging standards over the years. Back in the early thousands, for example, we used my absolute favourite, J1773 inductive charging paddles, also known as Magna Charge. We had one on my RAV4 EV and it was the absolute best. I'm still sad that inductive paddles went away, not least because they were far better for accessibility, but also because they were super easy to use. Chunky, but easy to hold, and not finicky about insertion. But for the most part, in the US we've had J1772 and the Tesla connector for low speed charging, and for rapid charging we've had Chademo, CCS, and of course the artist formerly known as the Tesla connector. <laughs> Chidemo largely fell out of favour a while ago in the US and Europe, although it's still on the current generation Nissan LEAF and it's still used in Japan. China uses GBT, which is kinda harmonising with Chidemo, gradually, but if you're in North America, Chidemo is not long for this world. The chargers will hang out for a while longer, but eventually they're gonna break or be replaced, and you're gonna need an adapter to rapid charge. And if you spend any time on the internet you'll know that such adapters are being made and tested by several different companies, so watch this space. And a lot of Chidemo chargers are single points of failure, making driving a Chidemo car on a long distance road trip in the US a bit more of a gamble. But that's kinda outside the remit of this video. So in North America we've been watching a battle with J1772 and its rapid charging kin CCS on one side, and Tesla's NAX on the other. Ford were first to jump ship, and a little while after their announcement, Jim Farley, Ford CEO, talked about the challenges he'd experienced with charging during his cross-country road trip in an F-150 Lightning. Charging has been pretty challenging, but it was a really good reality check, uh, the challenges of what our customers go through and the importance of fast charging and what we're going to have to do to improve the charging experience. Since then, we've seen essentially all automakers announce deals with Tesla to use the supercharger network, and announce that as of this year they'll be supplying vehicles with adapters to allow them to use Tesla's superchargers. And as of next year they'll be putting NACs, or as it's more properly known, J3400 connectors, 
directly onto their vehicles. And what's changing here is just the connectors, the actual physical plug, which I think is something it's worth reiterating. Teslas at superchargers use a proprietary communication protocol. That's the language they use to talk. Look, you can call someone up using your comm badge. Ensign Kate to USS Grissom. I've got a quick question for Spock about protocol. I would cite regulation, but I know you will simply ignore it. Rude. The equivalent to a protocol here is whether you both speak English. If you speak Klingon and your spy on the other end of the line only speaks Cardassian, you're not going to get far. Your Ford, Kia, GM, Honda or Hyundai is not going to magically gain the ability to speak the language Teslas use to talk to superchargers. But superchargers will gain the Babelfish-like ability to talk to CCS. Well, something along the lines of ISO 15118-2 and its DIN compatriot 700121. The Babelfish is small, yellow, leech-like, and probably the oddest thing in the universe. Has caused more and bloodier wars than anything else in the history of creation. Yeah, maybe the Babelfish was a poor choice, but you get my drift. So it's possible that the initialization process might be slower from plug-in to charging than you see with a Tesla plugged into a supercharger. And we'll likely, at least early on, see reliability issues there because each manufacturer uses its own dialect of those protocols and Tesla's supercharger team will have to make sure that the subtle differences in the way each engineering team has approached meeting the standards works fine with Tesla's implementation of the protocol. What I'm saying is that it may not be flawless. In fact, I will genuinely be impressed if it is, but I fully expect there to be similar issues to the ones that we've historically seen with CCS where cars physically connect but fail to charge because of a subtle difference in how the engineers at, say, Volkswagen and the engineers at Tesla have interpreted the standard. And you know why I think that? Because that's exactly what happened when Tesla started opening the supercharger network up in Europe to other manufacturers with CCS equipped cars. Hopefully Tesla and other manufacturers experience of working together in Europe will help them iron out problems before rollout here, but I wouldn't bet on perfection. Talking to industry insiders, we're expecting to see the first of these supercharger access agreements, by which I mean Fords, going live sometime in the first quarter of this year, and automotive manufacturers are we hear going to get access to the supercharger network essentially in the order that they signed contracts with Tesla and roughly a year out from when they signed them. To use superchargers with a CCS equipped car at the moment, you're going to need an adapter though. And whether legacy vehicles like the Bolt, the Kona, the current ID4 to name but a few will gain access at the same time as vehicles released to market this year is a question that no automaker has answered yet. Frankly, to what extent older legacy vehicles will be able to charge is another question we're going to circle back to in a bit, because honestly it's kind of hazy. But anyway, that gradual rollout should mean that while the supercharger network will have significant increases in the number of cars able to charge at it through the year, we hopefully won't see the sudden everyone can charge at a supercharger traffic jams that we might have had if everyone gained access at the same time. It should also give Tesla time to finesse its billing people for charging beyond 90% plan and its billing other companies for charging and possibly also billing slower charging cars at a different rate because they're occupying the charger for longer, although that might be complicated by legislation in many places that requires charging per kilowatt hour. Now this shift doesn't just affect rapid charging, it also affects level 2 charging because the new J3400 standard also sets up what those slower chargers will look like. And in a move that makes me kinda want to bang my head against the wall in 2010 European, the J3400 standard encourages chargers that are a lot like the chargers that have been around in Europe since, well, a decade ago. Unlike current North American level 2 charging stations, which have for the most part got the cable attached, with the concomitant problem of people damaging the cables by running them over, vandalizing the plugs, sealing them for their copper, etc, etc, the new standard requires a European-style Menekes connector on one end, 
and either a J1772, a J3400 or a J3068 that's a high power AC charging connector used for heavy duty vehicles on the other end. You know, there are times when it's just better if the government makes a decision. Like, you know, having a single charging standard for charging cables so that you don't have to wait a decade and end up with phones and cars that each need their own individual I'm a special flower charging cables. Now, like several other things in the J3400 standard, this isn't finalised. Voting members may decide to push for separate cables, which honestly, in terms of accessibility and reliability, may well be better, or they might decide to push for keeping the current chargers have attached cables system. This one we'll just have to ride out and see what happens. And another area in which level 2 charging might get a little tricky is that, see, Tesla's charging standard for its level 2 chargers has been for quite a while that they can run on and thus supply to the vehicle 277 volts, which sounds like an odd voltage, but it's one leg of a North American three-phase supply. This is neat because it allows you to use multiple legs to install multiple chargers from a three-phase supply, and you can just use one leg to install one charger. It also means you don't need a step-down transformer in the charger, thus making it cheaper. However, the J1772 Level 2 standard only ran up to 240 volts. What happens when you plug in an older car to a 277 volt supply? So I've asked a few engineers in the field and they say... Mm. Yeah, no one really knows, and so far the manufacturers have been keeping stumm. Most likely, I guess, it'll either work fine or the car will just not charge because it'll throw some kind of out of voltage limit error. I doubt we'll see cars on board chargers going bang, but as Scotty famously said... I don't know, sir. Now, I would say that historically, if your J1772 car has worked with what used to be called a destination charging adapter, that's the old Tesla to J1772 cable adapter, then they'll probably be fine, but no promises. And that brings us nicely back to the world of legacy vehicles. Again, from some conversations we've had, our understanding is that the various automakers will each have to work out how they want to sort out billing. Because Tesla's superchargers don't have screens, or RFID readers, or credit card payment systems, and all of the cars that we've seen from legacy automakers so far have been designed for connecting to systems that do. So whether that will involve registering your car's ID, probably using its VIN or some other specific identifier that your car can supply over the CCS data connection with your automaker, along with a payment method, or whether it might involve an app on your phone, or an app that's supplied to your car via an over-the-air update, or a dealer update, or whether it's by sending you a cassette that you upload to the car via its serial port at 1200 board. Oh, there's nothing quite like the sound of Arcadians in the morning. There's going to have to be a registered payment method and an active deal with Tesla before your car can plug in and charge at a supercharger. So it's not just going to be a case of having the adapter. And how those automakers will choose to handle the smallish number of older legacy vehicles, particularly truly legacy vehicles like, say, the Chevrolet Spark EV, the Kia Soul EV, the Hyundai Ioniq EV, not the Ioniq 5, the original wind knife, and the Volkswagen e-Golf, all of which may speak older, less well-supported versions of the CCS communication protocols, well, that also really remains to be seen, because while several companies are producing adapters that allow connection between a J3400 and a CCS car, without the relevant means of payment, you're getting no electrons. So let's be clear, despite this standard being published, there's still a lot more to do. SAE enumerates a number of fault conditions where the handling of them still needs to be resolved. Tesla still hasn't published the tolerances for connector and inlet compliance, which is causing delays in manufacturing. And there's more connector safety testing issues that the SAE still also need to resolve. And there's a UL certification process that also needs to be addressed. All that stuff is not expected to happen until at least the middle of this year. So while this is an exciting development, it's not everything we need. But what we've seen from SAE is a big step on the way to one standard to rule them all, 
and then hopefully the US can start moving forward faster with electrification. And that is a damn good thing. Thanks for joining me today. And if you've got thoughts, make sure you leave them below in our Discord chat room, or you can reach out to us on Mastodon. Thanks to the amazing list of people scrolling by on your screen right now. They are some of the more than 1,500 people who help fund this channel through Patreon and YouTube, covering our bills, paying our team, and making sure that we can be 100% independent. If you'd like to join them and see your name listed here, just follow the links below. There's a range of different tiers you can sign up for from as little as $1 a month, or if you pay yearly, just under $11 a year. A huge welcome to our newest supporters, Tantalus A. Bond, Michael Baker, Christopher Lawrence, David J. Stober, Noah Tutuk, and Ian Hoffman. To join the list and get your shout out, become a paid Patreon member for your week of fame. If you'd like to support us with a one-off donation, you'll find links below to make Ko-fi and Bitcoin donations, and we even have an old-fashioned PO box you can reach us at. Address is also down below. And if you're in need of some swag, you'll find our swag store in the down below too. This month, we're celebrating Electric for Everyone with an amazing new t-shirt designed by our in-house artist and animator, Erin. Get yours today by heading to our Redbubble store. We've got some great content coming up, so make sure you've subscribed on Peertube or YouTube, and we'll see you soon. We make new videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. If you want more, the mighty algorithm thinks you'll like this video, but we think this one is also well worth a look. See you soon, and as always, keep evolving!